All right, here's part two of Bites and Sting. So this is episode number 30. Last time uh, we talked about uh, spiders uh, and scorpions. Uh, <clears throat> this time we're going to hit the ticks. Uh, so there's basically two families of ticks, hard ticks and soft ticks. They've got fancy Latin names. And I think I hate these things the most. Uh, scorpions are pretty high up there, but uh, ticks are pretty nasty. Um, here's a nice fat tick getting pulled off. Uh, the bodies just completely swell as they drink your blood, these little vampire blood suckers. And uh, here's some example of uh, tick sizes. <clears throat> so you can see the picture of the dime in the upper right-hand corner. And these larvae and nymph stages can be really pretty tiny and very easy to miss when you're looking, um, looking for them. Uh, the adult females are typically the largest, followed by the males. So if you're going to get a tick off, <clears throat> it's very important to make sure you grab it as close to the head as possible. Uh, you want to do anything to uh, prevent this tick from barfing back up some of the blood meal uh, and getting into your body because that's going to increase the chances of passing a disease. So anyways, you want to grab it close to the head or close to the mouthpiece as possible and gentle, steady traction until it comes off. The idea of putting Vaseline over it to suffocate it or burn them off or any that frequently will cause this regurgitation. Um, so that's best to be avoided. Just gentle pressure, pull it till it pops off. And it may take a little bit of pulling, um, having removed these myself. So there's several different illnesses that can be passed by the tick. So it's not the tick by itself that's poisonous, but it's what diseases that these ticks have that uh, get passed to humans. And that's problematic. Uh, so here's a whole bunch of them. We're going to talk about most of these, but not all of them. There's a couple that are uh, viruses and there's nothing to do for them one way or the other. Um, but we'll talk about the things that we can uh, hopefully intervene on and improve our, our uh, outcomes. So the first one, pretty famous, Lyme disease. Um, most commonly noted or, or people most commonly think of it to be uh, kind of the East Coast disease, although you could see this just about anywhere in the United States. This is a spirochete. So these are, you know, uh, microscopic images of spirochetes, these little spiral-looking um, bacteria uh, that invade your cells. Uh, and the interesting thing about Lyme disease is you typically what's called a uh, target rash. So it looks like a bullseye or a target. So you get this uh, central red area followed by some clearing and then another red area. And you can actually have multiple ones, um, multiple circles of redness or erythema. Um, but as you can see in the picture of the child in the lower left, you don't always get that clearing area, so you um, you have to be suspicious depending on uh, the exposure potential, because you may not get this very classic textbook-based uh, bullseye rash. So uh, for the tick to typically pass the disease, they have to be attached for about a day to a day and a half. Um, that's, again, that's not always the case, but the longer the tick stays on, the more likely uh, that it's going to pass the disease. That's why you hear a lot of people talk about when you come in from being out in the field to you know, basically make sure you don't have any ticks on you, because the faster you get these things off, the better you off you are. But the problem is these black-legged ticks can be so tiny, uh, you can frequently overlook them, especially if... Uh, not to gross anybody out, but if it's in the groin area, you know, and so if you've got pubic hair or anything that would hide these ticks, uh, it can make it easy to miss. Um, again, here's another picture of a dime with uh, the tick in question. You can see they can be pretty stinking small. Here's another picture with a fingernail to give you an idea of just how uh, easy to miss these things could be. Um, so when you first get Lyme disease, uh, you can have very minimal, kind of maybe just some mild flu-like stuff uh, or no symptoms at all. Uh, the rash, if you get that classic bullseye rash, that could be very helpful to saying, hey, I think this is Lyme disease. But sometimes this rash doesn't show up. Um, most often the disease will go away on its own. It takes a few weeks for that to happen. Uh, but there's some long-term problems with Lyme disease that a few people can get. Uh, the progressive disease where the bacteria or the spirochetes uh, continue to grow and your immune system doesn't knock them out and they spread, they can affect some nerves, um, giving you some numbness or weakness. Uh, the couple of things that we worry about uh, that are sort of the dangerous ones are this inflammation of the heart, which is called carditis, uh, that can cause a lot of problems. 
You can get this chronic arthritis as it causes inflammation of the joints. Um, and occasionally if it spreads too close to the brain, you can get a meningitis or encephalitis. Uh, so there have been deaths associated with Lyme disease, obviously. So how do you treat it? Well, this is a long-term treatment, a uh, minimum of 10 days. could be as long as, you know, 28 days, or three weeks, um, almost four weeks. Um, doxycycline is the drug of choice. And the reason I have this in bold is you're going to see a theme with most of these tick-borne illness diseases. They can all be treated with doxycycline. The doxycycline is actually one of my favorite antibiotics that treats so many different things. If I had to have one antibiotic to take with me and I was traveling anywhere in the world, it would be doxycycline. Um, children sometimes can have some problems with uh, doxy, so amoxicillin is uh, another option, and you can use erythromycin uh, in pregnant uh, pregnant women. And there, there's a uh, medication that's only injectable. It's called ceftriaxone, uh, also known as rocephin. Uh, and if you've come in with the meningitis form uh, or the severe carditis, then we're going to be using ceftriaxone because that's going to be an IV or IM injection. The next one is babesiosis. Uh, this is uh, similar to malaria. Um, these are red blood cells, and inside the red blood cells, especially right in the center of the picture, you see these little round circle things. That's the um, organism inside the red blood cell. Uh, and just like malaria, who gets inside the red blood cell, they do uh, replicate and then basically cause the red blood cells to spill open and, and killing the cell as it does it. And that's why you can get some pretty good anemia with these types of diseases. So just like malaria, it's a protozoa. Uh, affects the red blood cells. Um, the nice thing about babesiosis is most of the time there's no symptoms, uh, and then this can go away. Uh, <clears throat> but if you get this one where you have these cycles where it uh, they grow, break open the red blood cells, you get this high spiking fever when that happens, you develop this anemia, uh, and then you kind of settle down as new ones start infecting new red blood cells. This one can be really hard to pick up. Uh, so if you have cyclic fevers and chills, and then you need to start thinking about diseases like malaria or babesiosis, um, especially in the light of any signs of anemia. Uh, you can do a blood smear. This is pretty easy to diagnose if you can think about it and have access to a blood smear and put the right type of stain on it. Uh, and then the treatment's a little different than the rest of them we're going to talk about. Um, so you, you typically use this combination, atrovacone and azithromycin uh, combined. Now, babesiosis is in the uh, United States uh, in multiple places. There's a spot in Hawaii that ha has signs posted as you're hiking on trails that it's uh, fairly common. Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever is number three. Uh, and the problem with Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever is sometimes it's Rocky Mountain Spotless Fever, which can really uh, kind of throw things for a loop. So if you do get the rash, which is a majority of people, but again, not all, uh, it's this rash that's kind of spread all over these little small uh, macules that we would call these little raised red areas. Uh, they can be on the palms of the hand. Now, there's uh, most rashes do not involve the palms of the hands um, or the f base of the feet. And so when I see that, I start thinking of diseases that I'm more worried about. Syphilis is one that can do it. Um, some types of blood problems we have breaking of blood vessels uh, that can cause rashes on the hands the palms and the and the base of the feet um, and rocky mountain spotted fever is one so if you uh, see this on the palms that's it's important to know about so after a few days of being bitten by a tick you can get these symptoms that sort of hit you very suddenly uh, like a ton of bricks you get the you know, the spiking fever frequently with a headache. And again, 90% will have the rash, but 1 out of 10 does not have the rash. Uh, and so without the rash, again, this can be really tricky to pick up. Other symptoms include uh, stuff that you see, again, in a ton of different diseases, you know, just like the flu. You can get nausea, vomiting, muscle pain, abdominal pain, and this conjunctival injection. I'll show you a picture of that, but that's the, um, the conjunctive, or the, everybody's sort of conjunctivitis. So it's this uh, lining over the eye, um, and it can get very irritated. Here you see all these very prominent blood vessels um, around on the white part of the eye. Again, conjunctivitis does not go over the iris or the pupil. It's just this kind of white part of the eye. Uh, these blood vessels are, if you put your finger on it and moved it up and down, you'll see the blood vessels move. Uh, and so this is what conjunctivitis uh, 
or conjunctival injection rather looks like. Injection just means the blood vessels are very prominent. How do you treat Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever? Um, doxycycline, again, 7 to 14 days, 1 to 2 weeks. Uh, so again, if you don't know whether it's just Lyme disease, is a Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, you think it might be one of the two. Uh, if you just shoot for two weeks of doxycycline, you're doing pretty good. Uh, the second line is a uh, medicine called chloramphenicol. Uh, that's not as easy to get anymore. You see that a little bit more in the third world. And the problem with Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is your immune system will uh, attack this. And because of this chronic inflammation, you get this vasculitis, which is an inflammation of the blood vessels. Uh, as you inflame the blood vessels, they'll sometimes clot off. And so you, you can imagine if you clot off small blood vessels throughout your body, you can cause all types of uh, problems. Now here's something that's fairly new, at least to our knowledge, uh, STARI, which is Southern Tick Associated Rash Illness. Uh, being here in Texas, we've seen a couple of these cases. Uh, we're not exactly sure what the cause is. The CDC is still working on it. They suspect it's a spirochete or one of those sort of spiral looking organisms like Lyme disease. Uh, but they haven't isolated uh, what is actually causing this. Uh, but they've treated it with doxycycline and they've had good success. So again, that makes us uh, suspicious. Again, it's going to be something like a spirochete. All right, rabbit fever or tularemia. Now, this you can get, it would, this is actually known as rabbit handler's disease, so people that used to trap rabbits could get this. Um, and feral hogs uh, can, are carrying this, which is kind of a bummer because this is one of uh, our favorite things to hunt around here. Um, in fact, my daughter's favorite thing to do is to go shoot hogs. Uh, and with tularemia, you can get these giant, swollen, inflamed lymph nodes that almost look like this massive zit. Um, Here's another one on a neck. And so you can see, you see the one uh, almost to the middle of the neck that's lower, but if you notice underneath the earlobe of this patient, you can kind of see a redness and swelling. There's another lymph node that's swollen at that spot. Here's a spot down by an ankle where you can just kind of get this chronic uh, wound, the, the sore that doesn't seem to heal very well. Uh, this is a bacteria called Francinella tularensis. It's an intracellular organism, and so it has to live inside of other cells. And it's one of the earliest documented cases of biological warfare. So in the 14th century, um, they uh, used this uh, in, a, in a, an offensive. Um, so 14th century BC, I'm sorry, I, did, I said 14th century, but I meant 14th century BC. That goes way back. Uh, this organism, this tularemia organism, is very hardy. Um, can survive in water, can survive in, in low temperatures, decaying carcasses. Uh, so I typically will use gloves when I'm skinning the hogs. Uh, I, I should probably do this more when I'm skinning deer, but uh, definitely when I'm doing hogs or rabbits, I, I like to use uh, gloves just because of this particular disease. In fact, it's so infectious that just by opening the culture plate, it's this kind of round plate with a plastic lid, if you lift that up without proper protective equipment, you can get infected. In fact, we had a lab tech at our hospital that got tularemia through this exact method. And how do you treat it? You can use streptomycin, genomycin, or doxycycline. And again, this is a little bit of a prolonged treatment if you're using doxycycline at least two to three weeks. If you use genomycin or streptomycin, you can uh, treat for a little less, uh, 10 days. Or you can do something like a fluoroquinolone, which is ciprofloxacin or levofloxacin. Um, but for me, to keep it simple, if I just know that I can pick up doxy and treat most of the tick-borne illnesses, I, I like to have that sort of clarity of thought. Uh, here's one called ehrlichiosis. Uh, That's named after a German guy that discovered it. Uh, here's a rash with it, and again, you can kind of see this central bite with some clearing, uh, and then the round circle of redness around the clearing. Uh, here's another type of the rash. You can see just these little red dots all over the skin. And just like a lot of other nonspecific diseases, you get just a variety of symptoms that make you feel bad. Fever, headache, fatigue, muscle aches. Um, you don't typically get a rash, but it can occur. Uh, and Similar to the vasculitis of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, this is uh, 
causes problems to your body by overstimulation of your immune system through a, a, something called TNF-alpha or tumor necrosis factor alpha. Uh, again, doxycycline, 7 to 14 days. So if we could just remember one thing about tick-related illnesses for most of them, doxycycline for two weeks. Q fever, Coxiella burnetti. Um, here's a picture of the organism. Very hardy, very resistant to heat. So, um, you know, if you're in a dry climate or arid climate, uh, this one it can really stick around. It takes a couple weeks before you start getting symptoms. Uh, cattle, sheep, and goats. So, if you're a farmer uh, or somebody that deals with livestock, you're probably a lot more familiar with Q fever than um, most of us that don't. Lots of symptoms, you know, pretty good fever up to 105 Fahrenheit, um, headache, night sweats, fever chills, productive cough, chest pain, abdominal pain, all these different things. Diarrhea is a little bit unusual compared to some of these others that you can't see in Q fever. Uh, most people get better all on their own, uh, but just like Lyme disease, if you can go on and develop a lot more severe systemic disease with uh, types of pneumonia or an infection of the liver causing hepatitis, infection of the heart causing the myocarditis, central nervous system complications like meningitis or encephalitis. Um, because the symptoms are so vague and obscure, it can be very hard to, to make. But guess what? Doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day, uh, will treat this again probably a, the 7 to 14 day range, but I'd, if I had to guess, I'd push a little higher to the 14 day range. So my bottom line in the tick-borne illness is that doxycycline kicks butt. Great antibiotic to have and use um, from a medical perspective. And the other thing is tick-borne illnesses can be tricky. Uh, you may never see the tick, um, you know, but if you get one of these classic, you know, rashes that we sh showed you, uh, especially remember the ones that look like a target or the, something that shows up on the palms of the hands or the bottom of the feet. Uh, and you just have to have what we call a high index of suspicion, uh, realizing that you are in a tick exposure potential uh, and then you wind up getting ill within the, you know, two weeks to four weeks after the exposure. Tick-related illnesses need to be uh, considered. And... Uh, and if your index of suspicion is high enough, but you can't confirm the diagnosis, it's probably reasonable to try a couple weeks of something like doxycycline. All right, stay away from ticks. They suck, literally. <laughs>